The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to Matthew. No, John. One of the twelve who was called Judas Iscariot no, went. No, no, no. Wrong. John. Yes. That one. After they had eaten the supper, Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, whom are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, Are you not also one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? 
Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They, they themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusations do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. They replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nations and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So you are a king. You say that I am a king. For this I was born. For this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? After he had said this, Pilate went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and crucify him. I find no case against him. They answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? You have no power over me, unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you're no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, 
Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the people read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, in order to fulfill the scriptures, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Please kneel. Please stand. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. 
Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows what he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundredweight. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. You may be seated. I also want to welcome all of you here on this very special day in the life of our Lord and in the life of each one of us. I also want to extend a welcome to those who may be joining us via our live stream. One of the most powerful scenes from a movie that I have ever seen is from the Passion of the Christ. And it is specifically the, path, the scene of Mary's mother at the foot of the cross. And as she sees her son being lifted high on that cross, she takes her two hands and she buries them into the ground. She just thrusts them deep into the ground and squeezes the stone and gravel and dirt, feeling the emotion and the pain of watching her son die before her. This afternoon, we stand with Mary at the foot of the cross. And at her side is the beloved disciple, John. Jesus first says to Mary, as we heard, woman, behold your son. Then to the disciple who represents each of us, the baptized, Jesus says, behold your mother. For Mary, this must have been one of the most profoundly emotional moments in her life and her life with Jesus. Perhaps she recalled the first instance, instance when she received Jesus into her womb. And when the angel said, I am the hand, and when she said to the angel, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. She could have not even imagined that it would come to this. Here she was standing before her tortured son, bearing the insults 
the swearing, the cursing, the jeering that was thrown at him. And perhaps even these people who were there jeering him and speaking so badly to him, perhaps they even tossed insults at her. In that culture, one of the ugliest ways to offend someone was to insult their mother. She may have asked herself again, how could it come to this? Like Mary, when we say yes to God's plan, we do not know where it will lead us. Amen? Amen. Think over the last year, the number of couples who have been married in our family of parishes, and it was a lot. I know because I did a lot of weddings. (laughs) But there were a lot of couples who pledged themselves to a lifelong marriage union. And it was a beautiful to witness, to witness the joy and the love that was being exchanged. Yet we know, as they know, we will all face trials and difficulties. And as any married couple remembers, for richer or poorer, for better or worse, in sickness and in health. For myself, I also remember the day I pledged myself to God, soon to be over 36 years ago. And especially on Good Friday, I remember the day of my ordination, because part of that ceremony involved prostrating myself on the floor of St. Peter's Cathedral in London. Like the priests, and we do at the beginning of this liturgy. Deacon Rick and I did that moments ago. Now I can tell you, I didn't know where it would lead when I said yes to God. But I can tell you there have been days where I go, what was I thinking? (laughs) I can understand why Mary said, you know, how could it come to this? There are probably days where I said that, how could it come to this? But I thank God. I'm glad he knew because I didn't want to know. I didn't need to know. In my case, there have been overall good and happy years, many. For whatever reason, maybe because God knows what a coward I am, God has spared me from the great suffering that I have often witnessed in other people's lives. Now, mind you, I've had my own, suffering two burnouts in my life, which were very painful. At the same time, I know that most of what might I have suffered came from some of my own failings and sins. As any one of us remembers, our parent would say to us, you have no one to blame but yourself. Amen? Amen. You must have the same parents I do. We stand at the foot of the cross with Mary and St. John. I believe as you would well believe as well. We all believe and are aware of our sins to some degree. Some that we've overcome, some that we are still battling. Those sins have put Jesus on the cross, suffering, on our behalf. 
Yet we are not just aware of our faults. We recognize something far more important, and that is the divine mercy. Standing before the cross, we realize that the divine mercy is like a massive ocean that absorbs all of our pollution and corruption. Pope St. John Paul said that divine mercy is God's limit on human evil. Now, we know that the ocean is immense and it can only absorb so much. It cannot protect us from all of our human excesses. Yet that is not the case with the divine mercy. If we turn toward our God, toward the source of divine mercy, God will take our misery upon himself as he has done and absorb the punishments our sins deserve. Now, this does not mean we merrily continue and go our way and sin and do whatever we want. We shouldn't do that any more than we should thoughtlessly pollute the ocean, the atmosphere, and our environment. What we need to do is to renew our pledge to the Lord. That's what our opportunity is for today, Good Friday, to renew our pledge, to renew our yes to God. And we could use well the words of our Blessed Mother Mary. I am the servant of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Amen.